Hi there. This is the Linguistics Career Launch session called Translation, Project Management, and Localization. I'm Nancy Frischberg. I'm going to be the moderator of this discussion. And Marcus Robinson is our Zoom producer today, and he's going to provide useful resources in the chat. So one of the, the reasons we called it this long, complicated name is uh, that several people in this group have had paths through translation into localization, and others have come from a different direction. So I'm really excited to hear about each of those paths from our panelists and present to you these options for career choices that you may have thought of, like translation, or that you may have never heard about before, like localization, which turns out to be relatively related. Rafaela Buciazzo is uh, from Salesforce, and she followed this path. And so we're going to hear something about how she had other employment before and got to where she is now. Andrea Vine had, and I worked together at Sun Microsystems about 20 years ago, and she pursued her specialization in internationalization and then took on some other tasks as well more recently. Uh, Mohammed Gafarian, I'm very happy to make your acquaintance through this panel. And he also has had experience in translation, managing translation projects. And so that's where the project management comes in, but now is also interested in localization and has a different language combination from the other people here on the panel. So without further ado, I'm gonna let you each tell a little bit about your story as uh, from a student to uh, where you got to today. So let's make this kind of an abbreviated version and then we'll poke into some of those pieces on the timeline as we go along. Who wants to start? Rafaela, you wanna start? Sure. Thank Great. you, Nancy. Can you hear me well? Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Nancy. Nice uh, meeting you, everyone. And thank you for the invitation today. So um, as in, in short, uh, I was born and raised uh, in Aosta Valley, which is a, a region uh, in Italy on the border with France and Switzerland. So I, I grew up uh, speaking Italian and also learning French from kindergarten, kind of bilingual. And then uh, um, when it was time to, to choose what to do uh, in high school, uh, I, I loved grammar. And so I I thought uh, mm, maybe I want to learn more languages. So I choose a high school that was specializing in, uh, in uh, languages and literatures. And so I added uh, to Italian and French, uh, English, German, and Latin. And then uh, when it was time to go to university, I was still enjoying languages. Uh, and uh, I had a couple of students from ex students from my high school who were attending uh, uh, the, the well known translation program at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. They came and chaired. The, you know how fun it was how great school it was how fun it was to live in Geneva such an international uh, place to live and so um, I I tried uh, the admission exams I succeeded and I started and I got uh, an MA in translation uh, from the University of Geneva specialized uh, in uh, um, French English uh, uh, into Italian translation and specialized in financial and legal translation and uh, uh, in short, uh, while I was uh, taking uh, my postgraduate degrees in terminology and machine translation, I, I found a job, part-time job, uh, in a financial software company in Geneva. And I started working there. You know, they, it was a small company, but they had uh, um, their clients were big names, big banks, uh, and so in Italy. And so they needed... Uh, uh, to translate, now today I would say localize, at the time I didn't know that it existed this word, um, translate uh, uh, their documentation and software into Italian, and that's how I started working for them. And uh, I worked for them a few years. Uh, again, I will go more into details later because it's, uh, it's a fun uh, an interesting thing that I didn't know what localization was. Uh, I didn't, I could barely use a computer at the time. And uh, then in 97, I met my husband from San Francisco. We lived in Geneva for a while uh, and me still doing, uh, uh, working in this company plus uh, working as a freelance translator. And uh, I sent my resume to 200 translation agencies and I finally got uh, five good customers uh, that I kept over the years. And when I moved to San Francisco in 2003 to follow my husband, 
I basically brought my my clients. Uh, you know, I didn't change my cell phone, and so that was big help at the beginning. And then here in uh, in Silicon Valley, I found out uh, that uh, my skills, uh, you know, as a translator, terminologist, uh, machine translation, they they were highly looked for, right, by by the tech uh, industry. And so I started working. Uh, uh, first as a freelance uh, doing a, a translation uh, at Apple, you know, as a contractor. And then I started working for a search engine. I don't know if you guys remember ask.com, the old Ask Jeeves. I was their uh, uh, Italian specialist. Uh, um, and that's how really I, I got into localization more and more. And then I worked for them for years. Then I got laid off. Uh, the company was not doing well. And then I started working at Cisco as a localization project manager for their uh, French support side. And I was doing also um, machine translation. So basically teaching uh, their uh, um, hybrid system, um, rule-based and statistical, how to improve some patterns for the French machine translation. And then um, after that, 10 years ago, I started working at Salesforce as a, as a localization program manager. I was responsible for all uh, um, Salesforce content, help release notes, that guides. Uh, it's a gigantic program, as you can imagine, we have you know, three major releases per year, you know, millions of words. Uh, and uh, that's where I, where I am. Three years ago, I became a people manager. I now have a team and I, I work with, uh, with everybody in the company because of course everybody needs uh, localization. So this is a nutshell. <laughs> so thank you for that very compressed view of a productive career so far. All right, we'll dig into some of those bits as we go along. Mohammed, tell me about your experience. Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to be here. Uh, nice to see so many, so many uh, nice faces. Uh, be among fellow linguists. Um, it's such a pleasure. Um, okay, so where to start? I think. Um, uh, so I was born and raised in in Iran, and and my native uh, language is. Farsi or Persian, you've, I think you've heard both. Um, it's, it's, it's confusing which one is correct. Uh, people have different ideas, but anyway. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the matter of language and, and, and English as a second language was, was with me, of course, uh, since, since childhood. And, um, you know, I, I started learning English when I was six, I guess. So um, I, I, my, my background, my, my academic career started from electrical engineering, actually. So I did my undergrad in electrical engineering in my own city in Iran. Um, and then, uh, you know, life took uh, interesting turns and, um, and I got into different stuff, activism and human rights mostly. Uh, and, and uh, you know, after a while, I had to I had to leave the country. I went to Turkey, and I and I taught English as a second language in Turkey, um, and that was a uh, that was a very uh, moving experience. Uh, you know, in, in, in so many aspects, um, and, and and one of the most important aspects of it was was living in a cross linguistic environment and a, in a cross cultural environment. Um, and, and, you know, having, having the background of being a, being a language enthusiast, uh, this, this passion for language and linguistics kind of, uh, uh, you know, grew in me exponentially. And, and I think after, uh, and, um, uh, and, and so, so after a while I, I got into the U S and, and I think, um, and, and, and during these years, I've done uh, numerous translation jobs, freelance uh, uh, translation works uh, from, in, from and to uh, uh, Persian. Um, and uh, I think my first uh, localization job in the US was 
uh, was as a localization manager for a, a satellite-based uh, internet technology, which was uh, which was aiming to reach uh, to the areas that are censored uh, and and uh, don't have free access to internet and internet content. And we would it was a new technology uh, that was aiming to reach to those areas where internet is also expensive um, and. My job was to, and, and, and part of the job was to package content and, and send it via satellite to, uh, to, to those areas. And of course, these content needed to be translated, subtitled, localized, and, and, and ultimately packaged and, and broadcasted. Um, and, and so, the, so that part was uh, a local, that, that job was a localization manager and a community outreach coordinator. Uh, the second aspect, which was the outreach coordinator brought me into this realm of communication and, and, and project management. And I think my uh, kind of, um, uh, the turning point of my, my career was this program management at, at this nonprofit um, uh, that, that whose mission was really to expand civil liberties and, and, and human rights through technology. And, um, and we would make mobile applications and technological tools for the purposes of human rights and, and, and civil liberties for Iran. Um, and so that was a that was a that was a program management uh, focused kind of job, uh, but of course, you know, for many of those tools, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel, right? We we, we could localize so so many so many existing tools. Uh, I can make one example for you. So um, uh, there is this very famous platform called Fix My Street, uh, started in uh, in United Kingdom. Um, and and grew like all over the world. This is uh, this is a platform where citizens can can report issues in their daily life uh, to be heard by authorities and officials. Uh, like you know, it, it can start from a traffic pot uh, pothole, or it, it it could it could be like a, a, a traffic light or whatever. And, and we localized this platform and, and this became a very popular platform in Iran, uh, you know, and, 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 and again, it involved many uh, localization aspects. Uh, and this is the same for many other platforms. Um, and so I think um, now, now I want to take a step back and I, and I told you about this, this uh, question of language being with me and, and that being nurtured and uh, grew into more even philosophical uh, questions. And, and I really at some point wanted to do a, a coursework uh, in linguistics. And, and that brought me in a very strange and interesting way to the University of Kentucky. Uh, and, I, and, I, uh, and I've recently uh, graduated from a master's of linguistics in the University of Kentucky. Um, and, and it was probably one of the most fulfilling experiences of my life, uh, you know, digging into linguistics and, uh, in, 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 on so many fronts and so many, uh, so many, so many aspects of it. Uh, the, the, the interesting thing about linguistics is that it, it has so many branches that just, uh, uh, you know, tickle, tickle your fancy and, and keep you going. Um, and so, so doing that, uh, I think I, I pictured my career as a, as a linguistic project manager or a linguistic program manager where my background and, and experience come together and, and uh, you know, um, things, things could, could very well match. And uh, in, after my graduation, I think I focused my job search uh, to, to be uh, a linguistic project manager. Uh, and and that that uh, um, that happened uh, for the most part. I'm I'm right now a software project manager at Franz, as Nancy mentioned. But the project that I'm managing uh, has so many NLP um, uh, and automatic speech recognition aspects. 
Um, you know, and, 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 and having that technical background, I, I was also very interested in computational linguistics and NLP. Um, and, and, um, and right now, as I said, the, 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 the project that I'm managing has, uh, has so many of those aspects and, and, and kind of it all worked out for me uh, pretty, pretty nicely and seamlessly. So um, yeah, that, that was, um, I'm sorry I rabble on. Uh, um, I, I stop here and I will be happy to get into more detail uh, on, on any of those. Good. And Monica has asked the question that I'm first going to, uh, that I, I know that we're, we need to answer, but I'm going to let Andrea introduce herself. So Monica, great question for, uh, foregrounding, I mean, previewing where we're going to go soon. So let's hear from Andrea, because I think she has a really different career path. Yes, it is a different career path. Um, funnily enough, as uh, Mohammed said, when he was a child, you know, he was, he was interested in certain things. And I, I was interested in language from a very young age, preschool age. I was very excited because where I grew up, um, there in elementary school, in, let's see, it was, it was grades three and four, they, they grade, grades three, four, and five, they um, taught Spanish to the children. I was really, really looking forward to learning Spanish in school. And my brother and sister, who are just a little bit older, uh, went through the program, hating it all the way. And I was really excited. And by the time I got there, they had abolished it. And I was incredibly disappointed. Um, I, tried to, I tried to learn some on my own. So, the, so I wasn't able to start learning languages until junior high, until uh, seventh grade, I think. Um, and I, so I, I took up German. Um, because there was some German speakers in my family or Germanic speakers in my family. So I took up German and I continued with it through high school. And uh, also they offered um, a, uh, for a little while, uh, Russian. I was really excited about that. So I took up Russian in high school um, because uh, there were there were a lot of Russian workers nearby, so they had the opportunity to have a, a teacher of Russian come to our school. That was really fortunate. So when I went to college, um, I, I was interested in computer science, but I also love languages. And so um, one of the first courses I took was one in artificial intelligence about natural language processing. Um, uh, this was a very long time ago. It's still very much, um, you know, sort of early on in the in the time of AI. Um, so I was looking into potentially uh, how could I combine my languages and my computer science into a major, and linguistics basically fit that bill. So um, I was able to uh, linguistics was kind of a random studies major because there weren't enough courses in the major to to make up an entire major on its own so I was able to take several computer science courses and many language courses and I was thrilled um, but I always knew I wanted to go into computer science I didn't know quite how I was going to combine them initially I was just a standard programmer uh, in insurance and then banking we um, really exciting. Um, and then I, I was living in the Northeast, uh, Northeastern US. And I decided that I wanted to go where the action was, which was Silicon Valley. So I moved to California and found a job. And the first job I found was a job as an internationalization program m manager, well, internationalization manager. Uh, basically, it was me, and I got to hire a programmer. Um, and I got into the field of internationalization. And I think, Nancy, you said that we would be getting into what these are later. Yes. So I will. Yeah. I, so let's just let's stick to your career path. Okay. Briefly, so, we'll so, so basically, that's where I stayed. I stayed in internationalization. Occasionally, I would do a little localization program management as I switch from this company to that company. But, um, you know, wasn't, wasn't my thing. Um, I really like to be 
and and when you find out what these are, um, it's on the engineering side. It's much more rewarding, I think, to be on the internationalization side of things. Um, so um, I went from com computer associates to various small companies and contractors to Microsoft and start up this and start up that and um, Sun Microsystems for many, many years. Probably the longest I was at any company was at Sun. And then um, I moved to England and I did some several years of contract work for Yahoo and then American Express. And then I had enough and I retired. And there you so, go. So I'm an old retired lady now. Yay. <laughs> Great. Okay. So uh, people are still potentially not clear on what localization is. And so maybe we should talk about all three things, localization, globalization, internationalization, how they differ, how they're the same, just so we have our vocabulary in common, or at least we know where the, the disconnects are between different definitions. So jump in here. I mean, Wendy's offered uh, a, a lovely excuse me, a lovely uh, definition in the chat. So Wendy, how, how did you come up with that? Do you know that from your life experience or do you uh, did you find that somewhere on the net? And you're welcome to speak if you like. Oh, she can't talk, sleeping children. Okay, so let me read out loud for anybody who is not able to see the chat, perhaps somebody in the um, replay. Localization project management is managing the project from start to finish, including negotiating, of things about budget, possibly recruiting and managing translators, editors, proofreaders, and preparing final files for delivery. So how do you, our panelists feel about that definition? What would you like to add to it or revise? I'd like I to add, sorry, go ahead. I just think we need to go to a more basic level. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> okay, good. All right, so give it, Rather than such a pragmatic, what are your tasks? Let's talk about what the goal of localization is. No, I think that we should first address, I think we should first distinguish between what internationalization is and okay. what localization is, because there is no localization. Localization is not possible if a piece of software is not internationalized first. So think of a piece of software that should be language and culture agnostic, right? So it should not be written just for one language, English. It should not be written just for one address format or for one date and time format but it should be written then to be able to plug in other formats because in each culture in each language you have different uh, different formats different ways to, uh, to 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 say the date to say the time to call people, right? And so uh, think of internationalization as the, the infrastructure. If that infrastructure is not there and it doesn't allow for supporting different alphabets, right, Unicode, and supporting different formats, uh, uh, localization cannot exist. And that's the problem in many companies, right? That they don't do the job in the internationalization part and uh, all the problems trickle down during localization and that slows down localization and you have a lot of, you have to fight, right? To get engineering resources to put in place, uh, to create that infrastructure to support uh, that a software is then localized for different languages to support dates, uh, times, different formats uh, and translation. Translation is the easy part in all this, right? So what do you think, Andrea? Yes, I, I like to simplify it and say, um, the words are what they, what they represent. Internationalization is making the software generic and localization is making it specific. Um, so, so the internationalization side is enabling and the localiza localization side is uh, specifying. But um, to be clear, in terms of formats, they, they tend to be, there's their fixed libraries that are typically used for formats. These libraries have been built up over time and negotiated and argued and, and so on uh, as uh, 
people have mentioned Unicode. Unicode is a coded character set. There's some very specific terms, but it's basically associates uh, characters with numbers so that computers can represent because computers know nothing about characters. All computers know is numbers. So Unicode has associated a tremendous number of characters with numbers. Um, and for the most part is used in the world, except for China, um, which has some compatibility and some, some differences. I don't know how, how much is still used in China, but when I left it was, that was still the case. Interesting. Okay, good. And Muhammad, do you want to add anything to these definitions on localization and internationalization or tweak it a little? Uh, I think be beautifully put by both Rafaela and, 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 uh, and sorry, your name, Andrea. Uh, <laughs> your name is under the little arrow. Um, but, uh, um, and I'm bad with names anyway. Um, but but I think I, I, I very much resonate with uh, what Andrea uh, um, uh, explained and, and described. Um, I think uh, the uh, as as Rafaela said, the ideal scenario for software is is that it's internationalized and um, and kind of uh, kind of uh, inclusively put together. But but then the reality is that. Um, from the user experience perspective and from the language uh, spe uh, perspective, uh, some of, some of the elements uh, you know doesn't doesn't quite work for for all uh, settings and in all contexts and all cultures. Um, and what 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 is considered lighthearted and funny doesn't is not considered uh, lighthearted and, and funny in in other uh, uh, cultures and settings so so some some user experience elements and some language uh, elements need to be um, uh, uh, adjusted and modified and, and that's where uh, localization comes into the picture where things are specified for for uh, a certain Local, locale. Mm -hmm. um, yep, that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Can I add something? Um, I like also. I also like to to sh to tell a little bit about globalization because there is a lot of confusion there too, right? Internationalization, good. globalization. What is what is globalization, right? So globalization uh, comprises these two big processes, right? Internationalization and localization, and also. A way, the way a company does business, right? Because if they want to go global, they need to support uh, international sales, you know, representatives. Uh, they need to have uh, technical support in different country. They need to support, uh, you know, marketing in different languages for different cultures. So it's really a big, big structure that uh, uh, it cannot exist uh, if uh, international markets uh, are put, you know, as a secondary priority, right? You need to have, uh, you know, executive uh, support uh, uh, to push, you know, a company with all this internationalization, localization, international marketing and support ahead to allow for globalization, to be, you know, truly global. Um, yeah. And I think this help, may help people now <clears throat> if they start thinking about how big the software is and then what the, the other infrastructure supports are, why companies choose to market only in five languages and not in 105 languages because you end up needing to have all that technical support and the customer support in all 105 languages if you're gonna be doing it that way. So I remember when I worked at Apple, Swedish was one of the languages that they were offering software in because Sweden was a huge market for them despite the fact that it's a tiny country relative to some other larger countries. But it was a good customer and they, they Apple at that time, this is the early 90s, was definitely supporting Swedish as well as Spanish, French, and a few other languages. <clears throat> so now, and, and then I have been using the abbreviations 
if you're in these fields, it's hard to write globalization, localization, internationalization all the time. Those are long words. And so that's why we use these cute little abbreviations, I18N, where there are 18 characters missing between the beginning of the internationalization until you get to the end of it, okay? And the same with globalization is G11N, I believe, and localization is L10N right? So there are yes. 10 characters missing. And now you're in the in crowd and you can do those things too. And can I add something before nope. anyone runs away with this? Two things, actually. We are, the, the three of us have, the four of us, I should say, have described the ideal scenario. This, is, this stuff doesn't actually happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh no, Andrea, are you going to tell the <laughs> truth? Having having seen the, the the back end and inside of it, it, it over a period of twenty five to thirty years, uh, well, I was still answering the same questions and still trying to convince companies to do the same thing over the the my entire career. But it, but the other thing is, and and people in this industry who know me know this is a big sticking point with me. These things, I18N, G11N, L10N, are abbreviations. They are not acronyms. Mm -hmm. There is no need to capitalize them. In fact, they shouldn't be capitalized <coughs> because it, they don't stand for anything. What does the one stand for? What does the eight stand for? What does the N stand for? Nothing. <laughs> so um, they are abbreviations. <laughs> That's a, uh, what do they call them? Um, Numer, oh, what was the term? Num numer, not numerizations, but something like yeah, that. Um, um, and the so. one, other, the one other like that that I know because it's uh, very important to me, and some of the other people in this group have heard me already, and that's A eleven N, A eleven Y. Sorry, but so it's called Alley, you know. Some people say Alley, but they. Alley, yeah. I hear. I hear people just read it as accessibility, right? Mm. So you don't, you, you see a one, one, Y and you read it as accessibility out loud. So anyway, yeah, I don't hear it's pronounced a one, one, Y or a 11, Y. <laughs> Whereas I hear localization pronounced L 10 N, you know? So anyway, abbreviations. Yes. Let's, let's agree on abbreviations. Okay. Let's see if we can they're get. Called, uh, they're called numeronyms. That's it. Numeria, numeronyms. I look it up. Old, <laughs> old lady, forget stuff. It's okay. Okay. I hadn't heard that expression before, but I get what it means. Numeronyms. Cool. Okay. So now Andrea says she's been making the same arguments over the last 25 years for different companies. And are you finding, Rafaela, also, because you've been in this business for a long time, but now you're in a company, you've been for 10 years in one company, so I'm hoping you don't have to keep making the same arguments. Well, uh, um, different arguments. Okay. I think that uh, um, in, in my experience, right, so far, I uh, unfortunately, I have to uh, partially agree with Andrea. Uh, there are situations uh, that are better. And uh, I've been a salesman for 10 years because it's a situation where things are better because uh, we, the localization team, we work hand in hand with uh, uh, the internationalization team of engineers. So it's a, it's a very close collaboration that we have with them, right? So these are the people that, uh, you know, the internationalization engineers, they support, uh, uh, you know, they externalize all the strings, uh, they add the libraries, uh, um, and they work with uh, uh, engineers, uh, teams uh, from other products, acquisitions that we buy, right, mm. to make things work. So uh, to make things work before we start the localization process. For example, um, just the fact that uh, we have uh, um, what we call a pseudo localization script, right? That uh, it's basically um, a script that engineers can run while uh, they are developing uh, their, their code, right? To make sure that uh, 
uh, they leave enough space uh, for when we translate uh, those strings, uh, right? Because when you translate from English into other languages, you have expansion, right? Uh, and um, they make sure that uh, by running this pseudo localization script, uh, um, they externalize, uh, you know, the, the strings, the software UI strings. Uh, uh, so all the, 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 the commands, uh, everything you see in, uh, in a software UI, they are externalized in, uh, in files that uh, we then take for, for localization, for translation, for localization. So that helps a lot. Um, and that's the important part, right? That's what uh, my team uh, does, uh, evangelize uh, among engineers uh, from other teams. We, we work with everybody. We work with you know, every Scrum teams, uh, a Salesforce. Uh, to, so we, we evangelize, uh, we share training videos, uh, every new hire in, in our department, uh, in the um, you know, tech, uh, technological department uh, has uh, an hour of uh, uh, training, every new hire has an hour of training of what they need to be careful when they start writing their code uh, and they need to write that code in a way that is localization friendly. So, you know, we, we are a few steps ahead of the game, but still it's, um, you know, a lot of evangelization, a lot of uh, code review that my team does, right? Mm -hmm. To make sure that uh, what the engineers write is correct, but not only engineers, we, we work with designers, right, yeah. as well, to make sure that the designers, they leave enough uh, buffers, right, to, to for expansion, so that you don't have, you know, truncation when you localize into other languages, and to make sure that, you know, you don't see flags, for example, that you don't want flags uh, when, you know, but you just want a language menu, language uh, menu for selection of the language, these kind of examples, I mean, there are many but also we also work with the product managers to make sure that we have since uh, you know you externalize those software ui strings in files that are then localized they are translated by our external translators with whom we've been working for 18 years right they are really our uh, um, subject you know knowledge experts of, of the field and uh, so the, the important part also, they translate those strings uh, out of context. Yes, we do a lot to prepare them. We do, we provide a lot of documentation. We provide glossaries. Uh, um, I mean, the, the new terminology for the new features for each major release that they then need to uh, localize uh, uh, in their language. But uh, um, then you still need to make sure that uh, what they translate makes sense within right the ui so what we do is that uh, you know we work with uh, you know teams to have uh, test environments where our translators where we can upload those uh, localized strings to make sure that they work right uh, that uh, um, one lab one ui string that was translated out of context makes sense when it appears in that place right within the ui so, you know, it's a lot of work uh, and uh, what we push uh, at Salesforce is uh, to have localization as upstream as possible, right? Not down the road, not at the end of development when it's too late to do anything. Whereas in other companies, the localization team is just, uh, you know, people will finish their development and then they will open a ticket to translate, uh, to localize uh, what they have already created. And that's too late, that's too late. You have no saying in anything. Whereas at Salesforce, we basically moved the whole thing upstream. So Yay. that's why things work better. It's not a perfect world. <laughs> we don't have endless budget. We don't have endless resources, but uh, you know, it's very good. My manager is uh, my manager is VP of globalization and localization. So you know she's uh, she talks to the people uh, that uh, they need to push. They need to have yeah. that uh, global mindset that uh, you need to have uh, when a company wants to be truly global, right? And even in our case, uh, things are not perfect because we don't have endless budget. We no, we cannot translate every every 
piece of uh, every document uh, into 34 languages, right? It wouldn't even make sense because again, as you, as you Nancy pointed out uh, um, at, uh, at Apple, you know, going into Swedish was because you had a, you know, an important client, right? So for certain languages, yes, we don't have a lot of people, a lot of customers, but we have important clients that, you know, if they don't request a certain uh, Docs, uh, why spending our money there where we can spend it into more Japanese uh, documentation because Japanese want more and more and more. Yes. So, so I want to pull out one phrase that you talked about several times and hope I want to check with the audience that everybody gets what it means. You talked about externalizing strings. And I'm hoping that everybody in the audience knows that means pull out the content <clears throat> from both the interface and the whatever the information on the page is. And by the interface, I mean dialogue boxes, error messages, all the labels around whatever the full content is, because that's content too, and that needs to be localized. And so um, I think that may also help us understand why Wendy is talking about in the chat. And unfortunately, she's got sleeping children, so she can't jump in and, and uh, duke it out with us. Um, but uh, I think she's talking about localization and how closely aligned that is with translation in the older senses. So you're hiring, it's not that your team is all uh, doing the translation, Rafael. Your team is making things ready for the translators to be able to be effective, <clears throat> excuse me, as effective as they can be, given that they're not on yeah. staff and they're not sitting in the same conference rooms as you. Yeah. Right. And again, okay. we try to, to do our best to the fact that, uh, uh, you know, they can ask questions directly, right? We've been working with them and with the same vendor and translators for 18 years. So, you know, there is uh, no competitive issues there. So, you know, it's really a big team and uh, clearly they are, uh, we consider them an extension of our, of our team. We sure. wouldn't be able to do everything we do. And, uh, you know, the, we prepare, we prepare for the in-contest testing or LQA, whatever you want to call it, linguistic QA. When we do, when we check that what they translate in our context makes sense within, right, the software. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's a lot of work to prepare all these, uh, to work with uh, all the stakeholders, again, from yes. engineers with core review, product managers, uh, um, designers. Uh, it's a constant uh, reviewing, uh, constant, um, you know, telling people how to do things, what to avoid, right? Uh, we, we, we do brown bags all the time within the company. Uh, we have office hours, uh, um, you know. Right. So and, and people come to see us, uh, you know, people ask right. you're questions. Both, you're, you're evangelizing outward, but you're also inviting the questions to come back to you. And Correct. so you are in a position of influencing, but not yeah. dictating. And so that Correct. makes, and, and because there's constantly a renewal of staff, you have to re-educate, you have to provide that basic education as people enter. And you also mentioned something that people may have not, you know, heard clearly, and that is Salesforce has been acquiring other companies and integrating that software into the Salesforce software. And so you've got a whole new batch of people who had a different way of thinking about it and now need to be washed in the Salesforce process. And I want sometimes, to go uh, sometimes Nancy, not really. It depends. Okay. You know, if okay. uh, if an if a company that we acquire has already uh, an internationalization team, a localization team, and things work well, right? We just you know bring them in and we work hand in hand with them. If a process, uh, you know, a scalable process already exists, then we work together. The problem is then when you have. Uh, something that is partially localized by somebody who did it in their free time now is not in the company anymore you know that's uh -huh. when you really need to to get it in and provide resources and make sure that uh, you know internationalization was done properly right and then you can do localization and you can take it from uh, things that were left essentially so you, so you see wanna, any sorts wanna, of cases i want to contrast your big company situation with Mohammed's small project uh, work. And so 
talk a little bit about how yours is the same and different. Your experiences, Muhammad, are the same and different as what Raffaella is talking about. Um, so, uh, so of course, um, you know, Raffaella and both Raffaella and Andrea are, are, are involved way more experienced uh, than me in the area of globalization, and, and their input is is. I think the ultimate say is in, in, in how things work in localization and interna internationalization. But from a, a small company perspective, things are um, things are a little bit more uh, simple uh, than, than than what Rafaela is is describing um, uh, beautifully. Um, so. So I, I, I can I, I can speak about uh, you know different projects that I've been uh, involved with uh, that had localization aspects, but um, really in my in my experience, it is uh, it, it boils down to two aspects. Um, you know, kind of um, uh, uh, translation and and in extensive user experience research uh, or, or uh, making making sure that that uh, you know UI elements and uh, and and strings uh, work for the context that we're localize, localizing uh, the content to so um, as I said uh, you know things things have different, Connotations, things have different uh, uh, meanings uh, attached to them in different uh, cultural um, environments, and that is something that we all know about. And so, um, r really, uh, I, uh, the localization management involves with working with UA, UX researchers uh, that that that. Uh, ultimately come back to you with the uh, result of their research that, hey, this UI element, uh, well, well, first of all, there are, there are generic and, 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 and general recommendations. And, and then, you know, going in depth and going in detail of, of UI elements and, and making sure that uh, the audience that you're working for um, are 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 uh, basically the UI elements are in line with your with what your audience wants to see. Uh, um, in in many of my projects, uh, like the culture of the products that uh, that we uh, produced in 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 United for Iran was really we wanted to come off as as a cool. Uh, techie uh, environment, but not and not coming up as as a as as a formal language, uh, you know, for, a formal language um, uh, th that we wanted to use. So so making sure that you know uh, it it has that cool aspect to it, like it has that lighthearted um, kind of humorous. Uh, aspect to the, to the UI element that that is where you know the localization uh, manager and UI, UX researchers really work hand in hand uh, to make sure that 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 tone uh, and that that cultural culture that you want to represent is is conveyed in in uh, and and used so. Uh, so again, it's a lot more simpler than, than what Rafaela uh, mentioned, but in my experience, it boils down to translation and UX research. Um, okay. Interesting perspective. Andrea, I'm going to read you a question we got, I got privately in the chat and, and see if you can respond to this. Developers write software using code. Does that mean their code is internationalized? No, this is, every question is legit. <laughs> it's a good question. It's a good question. I'm not laughing at the question. I'm just, uh, no is the short answer. <laughs> um, ideally, um, you have, 
Ideally, you, the software engineers are educated as to how to write internationalized code. Um, depending on what programming language or languages they're using, what libraries they're using, um, there's, there are easier languages to write internationalized code. Um, and there are libraries, there are good libraries to use. Um, and it's best not to reinvent the wheel. What I felt was my job, because most companies just had no idea, they thought, oh, I'll hire an internationalization engineer and she'll just internationalize everything for me. Um, and that's not the way it works, because you can imagine, let's take, for example, um, okay, so I worked at Sun Microsystems, and many of you may know the Sun Microsystems Unix operating system, Solaris. Now, I did not work on Solaris. There are other people who worked on Solaris. Um, but if I were to internationalize all of Solaris, there's no one engineer who knows the entire product code, code base of, of right. Solaris. It's, it's impossible. It's, it's impossible. These are big, big products. So the idea that they could just hire a software engineer to go and fix everything herself. Wave the magic nobody... wand. Don't you have yeah. that magic wand? What's going on? Yes. You're an internationalization they... person. Yeah, good, good device. Must, must use later. Um, so I, uh, um, my, what I felt was my job is to educate the engineering staff as to how they can internationalize and provide them with coding examples and provide them, them with concept concepts and point them to libraries. And um, much later on, and I mean much later on, there there was there were some tools. Oh God, I've got that question. Isn't there a tool? Yeah, isn't there a tool to replace you, Andrea? Yeah, well, no is the answer. Um, um, but there are tools that help that are, are kind of a, what we would call a lint tool or a filtering tool, which can analyze code and point out potential problem areas. And you can tweak the configuration of the tool to um, uh, be more to, sensitive, to be customized, and yeah, to be, to be customized to that particular set of code. But every programmer writes their code slightly differently. So the, you'll get a lot of false positives and you'll miss a lot of... Um, positives. Uh, so, you know, it's helpful, but it's not complete. Um, and so, for example, Raffaella was talking about pseudo localization. And um, I have a on my blog, the nine things that you can test using pseudo localization. I'm not saying that I've ever seen a company exploit pseudo localization that way, but it's possible. Um, so, um, so, so the answer is no. And one of the reasons why is that um, internationalization is not taught anywhere. So if you, go to, if you go to university, if you go to high school, if you learn programming, if you go to a, a special um, certificate course, it, internationalization is not taught. What little is taught are things like, um, there, people are taught about Unicode maybe. Uh, and they're taught using Java, which handles internationalization much better than C or C++. Um, so, um, they, so new engineers come in and they have to be taught again and you know, over and over again as, as, as the turnover happens in the company. They need to be taught again and again, and they need to be reminded. Um, and it's difficult because if you don't, if you don't think with an international perspective, if you don't look at things with an international eye, um, then you'll miss things. So, um, and I think that's that would always be the case. Um, and it manifests itself in typically in the localization process. Um, so this is why I said earlier, why I as an engineer prefer to be on the internationalization side because um, localization treats the symptoms and internationalization treats the disease. Um, and it, 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 I mean, that's that's really the case, you know. I'm, um, I'm suffering monolingualism, please help me, right? Yeah, so, you know, as, um, um, as George Kemp said, you know, um, user experience has the same issues. 
you really need to be in there from the beginning to design things in. Otherwise, it's lipstick on a pig. So, um, <clears throat> and you could say the same thing about security and about performance. All of these things are things that need to be designed into the product and written from day one to work well. Um, it's just that uh, it's more stark in the world of localization that the, the, the problems are much more obvious. Um, but it, it, is, it is an issue with all of these other um, peripheral disciplines, if you will, in, in software development. I hope that answered the question. I, I hope it did too. I'll, I'll, I'll wait to hear from our questioner to see if they have any more, uh, they need any more expansion on that. So I would love to call on Wendy if she's still available. Are you here, Wendy? Because I think the kids woke up. And so you may have more, you may have comments also to add to this discussion from your standpoint as a localization or translation project manager. I um I was trying to say I wanted to I wanted I wanted to type that um, quote to save it for um, localization treats the symptoms and internationalization treats the disease. I need to save that for future reference. But um, right, and and Rafaela said the same thing, so you can copy it out of the chat. No. Oh, okay, good. Um, <laughs> so and it's Thank so you, encouraging Andy. to hear these about these processes and these companies that take. Um, those types of problems so seriously because I think um, part of you know why I've been kind of you know trying to find other applications for linguistics is that I feel so frustrated in positions around localization because mm -hmm. everything I've encountered so far has been ex you know exactly the opposite of what <laughs> of what they were describing um, and I, I don't want to mention the name of the company where I'm working but Right. Um, we can go look you up on LinkedIn and figure it out, right? She can figure it out, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, and, and, and it's evident to, you know, when, when if people are looking and for healthcare organizations, you know, and and I, and in our field, I guess, you know, localization is also kind of loose, a loose use because it's, um, you know, the languages are all going to be um, for U.S. Um, speakers. So, you know, we're looking at Spanish for the United States, Russian for the United States, Vietnamese for the United States. So, those types of um, populations, but um, the any sort of marketing and web content that's designed um, by our you know mar marketing teams and things are designed with with no thought for use in different populations, and um, and when they get to the point of wanting to to um, to translate it. Um, there's also so much security that we can't even share um, the, the tech, the content with translators um, besides screenshots necessarily, you know, so it, a lot of things are behind a sign in firewall. And okay. so we're taking screenshots of websites and sharing it with the, with translators. And there are things that are just not, um, you know, that are not um, applicable or, or relevant and, um, and they say, no, we just do it. You know, we just, we have to, we're required to provide this information in every language. We want to check that box, um, you know, turn it around, give it to us and we'll be done. <laughs> and I think what you're describing is what Rafaela is arguing against, namely, exactly. you're talking about way downstream localization. Right. And you're only and worrying so about localization of content and not so much about localization of interface and still you're right. way and downstream. I, and I guess you can argue that, you know, if you're in if you're in an organization that is targeting only the US population, um, you know, okay, they're not as interested in other markets. However, they are interested in the entire US population and they're not looking at that from from the beginning. But you also see it in in, for example, um healthcare um, software that you know, I think was recently um, in the news for how how horribly it was designed. And when they tried to sell it, market it outside of the United States, it was just not usable because it was requiring things like what's your health care, what's your insurance provider. Um, you couldn't move forward with um, recording patient health information unless you had this type of data, which didn't exist outside of the U.S. content. Right. The content. So if you have a national health service, 
and it's not coded in as an insurance provider, then you can't move ahead. Right. And it right. just, there was no consideration to that. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's yeah. very encouraging to see that that is not always the case. And there <laughs> are, <laughs> there are, there are organizations is that take that, yeah, that take it into consideration. Okay, so great. Thanks so much, Wendy, for chiming in there. I appreciate your perspective and your uh, kind of adjusting us to the off of what's the ideal and what do you have to work 10 years in order to set up and create those relationships versus if you've got an organization that isn't even aw awakened to the potential harms that they're causing and in a healthcare setting. That's really scary. Right. I, I wanted to address another question, but I see we have a question in the chat that I'll, I'll take first. And that is, uh, does anybody want to offer advice on breaking into translation? And uh, this person finds herself stopped by the certifications that she doesn't have, but that may be something specific to the US. Sorry, I keep banging my microphone. Um, so who would like to talk about breaking into translation? Um, if you want, I can a little bit. Um, it's sure. maybe all the it's maybe all the information by now, because when I when I moved to the United States uh, from from Europe, so in two thousand three, uh -huh. I um, so I was a freelance translator, right? And uh, I had this experience uh, in the financial software company without knowing that it was co-localization. So when I arrived in San Francisco, I, I definitely didn't know anybody from my field. So um, remember my husband, uh, my husband and I looking into uh, finding a, a local professional organization, which by the way, I didn't believe in because it was not such a European thing, professional organizations. But so he, he insisted, say, let's, let's go to this general meeting of the Northern California Translators Association. And so, you know, very shyly, very, you know, not convinced I went there. And um, I found my, my initial group, essentially, my initial community, all linguists, all translators, all there to talk to each other, to refer each other, to each other. And um, I was then invited to be part of their board uh, I, where I volunteered for six years, I organized their events. It was great because, you know, as an event director, I was organizing all the events, workshops, general meetings. And so it was a great opportunity for me to meet people, right, from my field. So networking, you know, was was the big thing, and um, and then uh, and and that's by the way how I met someone who was working at Ask.com, my first real job uh, in Silicon Valley, you know, after freelancing, you know, at Apple or keeping my customers from Europe because I didn't change my cell phone. Um, but, you know, I needed more than that. I needed a, a fixed income to survive in San Francisco. And so it's, it's a, someone, someone from the association who was working at us.com said, hey, we're looking for an Italian uh, uh, localization specialist. Uh, uh, are you interested? And that's, you know, through this connection, through this networking that I created going through the NCTA that I was able to get my first job. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, I got my job at Cisco going through, uh, you know, I lost my job. I was laid off four years later. And uh, I, I went to uh, a, uh, one of those groups uh, uh, that are, you know, where people look for, for a job. Um, it was the first time in my life that I was losing a job. I was not used to being laid off, right? That's so US. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I was there and uh, we were in um, San Francisco at St. San, San Mary's Cathedral. Uh, and um, so everybody was- Wait a minute, was this, the great, was this the Grace Net group or is this a different group? I think it was that one. I don't it think it exists it anymore. Mary's. It was at the other church. It was at the... Um... The one on Nobby Hill in San yes, Francisco. I was there. Nothing was to there. do with the church. Nothing to do no, with the church. Right, it was right, really right. open to anybody. And I arrived there. I told people what I was looking for. But uh, 
I, I, was, uh, I was doubtful because uh, people usually don't understand what I do. People don't know localization, people don't know terminology, nothing. Whereas after I presented myself in, what, in front of this group at the end, a woman came by and said, you know what, I think I know someone. I was looking from, for somebody like you with your profile. And uh, so somebody from Cisco was actually looking for someone exactly like me, what I, you know, and so I talked to this guy, you know, 10 minutes into the conversation, he said, yes, it's you, and, you know, of course <laughs> I was, I had all, you know, all the checkbox, uh, and that's how I, I went to Cisco, and um, Salesforce is the same thing, I started going to the, do you guys know, have you ever heard about localization and conferences? They used to take place before the pandemics a couple of times a year. Uh, they are organized by my current manager, Theresa Marshall. So it's basically open to anybody, it's free, people can go there. And uh, people choose the topics that they want to discuss essentially about localization. And uh, so I went to one of these organization uh, and conferences. I met her, we had a nice chat. When it was time for her to look for someone to hire, she just sent me an email and it was a good timing because uh, Cisco, you know, I was a contractor at Cisco and my manager didn't have money for me for the next year. So, you mm -hmm. know, I started looking into something and that's how I ended up at Salesforce. So my big, uh, my big uh, recommendation, if you want to move, uh, right, uh, um, either in translation or from translation to localization is to start go out there. I know now it's not a good timing, but before, you know, attend all the meetups, uh, all the, you know, uh, this, this places and mingle with people talk to people tell people what you want and what you're looking for that's my big recommendation great yes networking we've been promoting this everywhere sorry i just put a, a link in there that i didn't intend to i put it into the slack separately here's the definition of an unconference that's what i was trying to add um because i think unconferences are great and they really respond to who happens to show up. The motto of the unconference is, whoever's here is exactly the right group. Whatever we talk about is exactly the right topic. And for the length of time, that's the right amount of time. And if you're and not you know what? Uh, maybe there is uh, maybe there is an opportunity for a, a translation and conference. Hey, there we that go. That somebody can organize a translation and conference, right? Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. There's this, there's this one other thing, Nancy, that I wanted to mention real quick uh, Please. about about Laila's question, <clears throat> and 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 you said that right. You know, when looking for uh, uh, advice and getting into a field, you know, you don't hear a, a whole a large variety of things. You know, you, you hear a networking. You also hear. Uh, being able to have a sample of work or, or being, being able to have something to present yourself with. So, okay. so uh, uh, I think a lot of the, of the freelancing uh, can, can also help the, the platforms that you can present yourself on that, that shows the history of your freelancing work is, is, is also useful. So um, I know one platform uh, called Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R, -R, mm -hmm. uh, um, that, that, that should be also useful that you can pre uh, present your skill, um, get orders from people. There is a rate and review system there. So, so it, when the time comes, then you'll be able to say to your next employer that that quite, uh, you know, coincidentally, as Rafaela uh, uh, described, then you'll you'll be able to say, "Hey, I have also this sample of work, and and people have have rated me uh, such and such." So, anyway, great. And well, can I also add? It, I'm not a translator, and I never have been, so I'm just going to throw this out. Um, to create a body of work, yes, you know, maybe you can go into these sites where people will pay you, but there's a lot of sort of crowd translation places. And if you're looking to develop a body of work, that might be something you could do um, to, to, to say, look, I've done this uh, for this open source thing. I've done this, I've done this. And so you can, you can have something to at least show that you've been, you've been working, you've been progressing um, 
So even if you're not being paid, you know, while you're searching um, to try and do some of this to develop this body of work, to develop your essentially your portfolio um, to show. So I, I, I have a feeling that would that would help as well when someone is asking to see your work or asking you to point them in the direction of something you've done. If there's an open source piece of software that you could actually point to and say, look, I translated this part of that software, um, then uh, that that probably is a useful thing. Mm -hmm. Good, okay. So Translators Without Borders is another suggestion of a place to network and also be able to discuss your work. And then uh, Kiva, talk about, tell me what Kiva does, because I'm not familiar with that. So Kiva, they do uh, microloans uh, to right. people in the developing world. I used to know the, the, the uh, translation uh, manager there, and uh, they often uh, need people uh, in, so, in all sorts of languages. And, you know, if you add uh, two places like that in your resume, it's already something nice. Because at the end of the day, when you look at a resume, right, you need to hire someone, you need to see something, right? Uh, not just school. You need to see some uh, uh, experience. And sometimes that's what people struggle with, right? To find the opportunity to experience and to, uh, to prove that they can translate, right? Correctly. Good. Okay. And another thing that I would like to uh, suggest, uh, maybe people are fully aware of this, but I think that uh, um, a specialization helps a lot uh, uh, translators, right, to find uh, a job, specializing in something. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's key, I think, to, to our profession. So what counts um, as specialization? Do you mean specialization? specialization I can give you my example. So I specialized yeah. uh, in legal and financial, but that was in school, right? Uh, then uh, I started working for this financial software company. I told you I had, uh, I could barely use a computer at the time. So I started translating uh, software content. Imagine what I knew about nothing. So it was, of course, a, a lot of, you know, a huge learning curve, but I learned a lot about, you know, banking, telecommunication, you know, so such a thrilling field, but <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That opened up a lot of doors that I didn't imagine, right? Uh, software localization in Silicon Valley. I don't think that, uh, I would be, I would, I could have done, uh, as, you know, uh, come if I had some knowledge, you know, uh, from previous experience. So, and when I moved here, my mother-in-law told me, Rafaela, just say yes, unless, you know, it's a theoretical uh, uh, physics, right? <laughs> so, but say yes to, you know, don't be shy, don't play the European that, uh, you know, if they don't have a requirement, they, you know, if they don't have the 10 requirements to say, oh, I cannot do this job. No, just go out there, try. And this is another recommendation that I give to people. Just go out there, try, and, you know, put the effort, do your, you know, a duty. And, uh, and, and today you find knowledge, you find it on the web. In, in the mid 90s, there was none of these uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, right? Uh, today, you can learn a lot. You can go to all these, um, you know, blogs. Andrea said that she has a blog on internationalization. Hey, I'm going to check it out, you know. Oh, and Andrea, uh, so, put it in the chat. Put it in the yes, chat. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, clearly she knows what she's talking about. Uh, it, it's, there is plenty of resources online, even without paying. Uh, for you to learn and, uh, you know, to prepare for an interview, to prepare, even if you don't have the full experience, right? But, you know, to start uh, chewing the terminology, you know, what, you, what people want, what people need, and start going in a direction. Does so it make I, sense? Makes perfect sense to me. I think we're getting some thumbs up from some of the audience, and Layla is still pushing on this thing of certifications. Does she need a certification from some international? Which certification are we talking about? Uh, can you specify? I think, I think she's talking about Spanish English translation. Is that true, Leila? Yeah. So, a certification are you talking about the, the 
uh, the American Translator Association uh, specific, or CMI uh, certification. Or, that's the one she uh, mentioned also CMI. Well, again, that's something that helps, right? If you have in your resume a certification um, plus some concrete experience, I think that uh, that will help. However, personally, what I look at a resume is uh, the experience, then the certification, because there are a lot of people uh, Take, for example, somebody who comes from a very, very technical field. You know, think of, a, think of a chemist, for example, that suddenly wants to go into translation, right? Somebody who he has enough of being a chemist. He knows a lot about the field and, you know, he can start doing very, very technical uh, translation. So I wanna see, you know, what he has done, what kind of experience he has before knowing that he has, uh, you know, some uh, certification from, uh, even from the American Translator Association. Um, you know, you can do both uh, if you have the time, right? Prepare for the certification and, uh, you know, uh, add experience, uh, pra practical experience. But I heard you explicitly say you look at the experience first and the certification second. You know, there was a time when I was when I was looking at uh, the 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 degrees. That's when I didn't have enough experience. Today, I look uh, a lot of the experience and then at the certifications. So this... because there are people that uh, they learn a lot, <clears throat> and you know, they learn a lot, and they they prove they prove it, you know, by doing it. Um, so this is this is. Uh, I want everybody in the audience to know we did not feed them any hints or anything like that. The fact that you're making the same recommendations that we've been making in our career management track is not a coincidence. It means that we're all talking about the same processes, at least in the US. And <laughs> that networking counts, not paying such strict attention to your ability to fill every single requirement, your ability to show some project work in some way, you haven't yet said it out loud, but some of that project word work probably would help if it says you've worked on a team and had some collaborative experience that you can point to. And um, what else did we say? That certifications are useful and school learning is useful, but it's not the only way in. Is that fair? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And you know what? Have, have uh, we my... said it enough for the audience? But I want to know, <laughs> do I need to say these things again? <laughs> And that's the beauty, that's the beauty about America. There is still a big difference. Uh, I don't know if you, Andrea, agree is that you live in the UK, right? But there's still a big difference between Europe and uh, the United States. In the United States, you need uh, everything you just said, the big baggage, right? And, uh, and then at the end, you have the certifications. Uh, here, unfortunately, in, uh, in Italy, at least in France, in the areas that I know, there is still a lot of, uh, you know, who you know from your family, from your friends, uh, you know, because people were born and raised in the same place, right? They got job in the same place. Whereas uh, in the States, you know, everybody comes from a different place, right? And so we, need, we, we are there, we all help each other, right? And, uh, and that's fantastic. Uh, that that's what I like about, uh, you know, uh, at least California, the one that I know the best. <laughs> I, just to just to answer your question, I, I haven't worked for an English company. I have worked for English people, but not for an English company. Um, I so I can't comment. My, my husband has. Um, engineering is a very different animal here. Um, mm. So it's, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, it's king. And here it is, you're maybe one step above a plumber. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's, it is very different here. Uh, and female engineers, it's very, very different here. So, um, uh, so I, I couldn't get a job uh, with an English company. <laughs> uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have had a career the same career in uh, in Europe uh, as I had uh, in uh, in San Francisco in the, in you know in Silicon Valley in the states right. definitely yeah. absolutely and, not and um, 
uh, I, I would say too um, that the the way I got the two jobs that I did get while over here, uh, because I didn't really have a network over here, but internationalization is a very uh, small field. So um, my first, my Yahoo job, one of my um, colleagues in the field, he called me up one day and he said, I know you're not doing anything, Andrea. How about working for Yahoo? <laughs> So that was that was one, and then for for American Express, um, again it was um, somebody who knew somebody who they they were looking for somebody who was in in England, and so they they recommended me. Um, so that's how I got that job. So it was totally from my network that I got those two jobs. And I will also say to uh, those of you who are looking for work. Um, no recruiter has ever found me an internationalization job or interview. Not one. I have talked to many, many recruiters. In engineering, recruiters, oh, they're desperate to place you because it's big money. Um, but there's not one HR person who ever found me internationalization work. And I would venture to say that there's not a lot for localization. They do not understand it. It's not a term on their sheet. It, their automatic resume reader does not pick it up. Um, it, it just, it doesn't exist. So if you're looking to go into these fields, don't waste your time with a recruiter. It, and it, you're it, talking about an external recruiter now, I believe, right? Rather well, than company any, any, to be honest, any recruiter or any HR person. They know not. Even you're much internally. better off going in through your connections, through um, trying to get the name of the of the person. I mean, if if a company's HR department posts a job, okay, apply to that job. But you know, I, I would I would say I wouldn't waste my time with recruiters. I, I tried to educate them. I I have to, I can't tell you how many recruiters. My brother is a recruiter. I, I, I've talked to billions of recruiters. Okay, maybe, maybe I'm exaggerating just a little. Um, but, but really, they, I have gotten nothing from them. So I, I, after a while, I just decided, mm, meh, I, I'm, I'm, it's a waste of my time. Um, and can I and, add something? Even yeah. at Salesforce, every time we have we post a job opening, I need to work with the recruiter for a session, for an informative session of who we look for, what it is that we're looking for, because people don't get it unless you explain to them what they need to look for, you know, uh, and you know what kind of resume I want to see, right? Right. So completely agree with you. Yes. All right, uh, we're at the end of our yeah. time. And I wanna respect everybody. I wanna thank everybody who's been participating and all the people who've been uh, listening and contributing in the chat. I appreciate all of you. And I wanna see if there's any closing comments we wanna make before we let this audience go. Uh, Mohammed, I'm gonna call on you first because I haven't heard from you for a little bit. Um, uh, not really, I mean, um... So I, I recently got out of job market, and it's a it's a it's it's quite an experience uh, being in, in the job market, especially in the linguistics localization field. Uh, it can be overwhelming, uh, you know. All I, all I want to say is that um, you know quality of, of your job comes out of the quantity of, of, of the number of job applications that you do. So, so don't, don't lose your hope. Just keep applying. Uh, it, it will, it will happen if you're, if you're in the, uh, you know, in the job market, um, and, and, uh, yeah. Um, and, and do, do the typical things that you hear everywhere and networking, uh, try to collect a body of work and, and it will happen. Don't, don't lose your hope. Good. Thank you. That was very brief and very to the point. Good. Andrea or Rafaela, who wants to go first and who's going to go last? Andrea. Um, well, I, I would say along the lines of networking, if you're interested in internationalization, um, I will 
connect with you on LinkedIn, LinkedIn, because I have loads of internationalization connections on LinkedIn. So you can contact me there. Okay, super. And I'm assuming that people from this uh, LCL can contact each of you through LinkedIn, right? Good. Thank I'm you. Excellent. Raphael, yes, absolutely. any closing absolutely. comments? And Anybody can contact me, you know, ask questions that uh, we didn't cover during uh, this meeting. I also want to say I am very grateful that uh, I was, uh, that I am a linguist because uh, that allowed me to move to the other side of the world uh, and have a career. I don't think that I could have had such a beautiful career uh, if I had been a doctor, for example, or a lawyer, you know, uh, which are much harder. Uh, so there, there is a lot of hope uh, and uh, languages, they all open, you know, doors in anything, right? In sales, uh, in, uh, in, in, in anything. So, you know, don't just continue, right? Uh, send those resumes, uh, do those, uh, uh, those uh, translators without borders, uh, have experience uh, and networking, definitely networking. Good, networking yeah. and networking through affiliative organizations yeah. is a wonderful method of both learning more about your own field, but also getting access to an early access to people who are thinking about job openings. They haven't even formulated it yet, but you can have that conversation. So I appreciate everybody's comments and contributions. And I think we can stop the recording. Mm -hmm.